Hello. Today, inevitably, I am going to talk about the horrible situation that is unfolding in Eastern Europe in the Ukraine. It is responsibility of one man, of Putin. But I'm not going to utter rude names about Putin. I'm not like our defence secretary, you know, in that schoolboyish sort of junior officer fashion, encouraging the regimental junior rugby team, you know, come on, he's gone full tonto. I'm not going to utter insults. I'm not going to say he's mad. I certainly think he's bad. At least he's bad in according to our values. No, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to try, which you should do surely with your opponent in anything, is to understand them and to understand them on their terms, not your terms. Our problem in dealing with Putin is that we think, as we tend to do, that everybody should have exactly the same values as a nice, sensitive, woke public school girl age 16. You know, it ain't true. There are varieties of human experience and once upon a time, historians dared to confront them. They stopped doing that anymore. They want the past to conform to the present. Sorry, I'm an old-fashioned historian. I believe in encountering the past on its own terms, and I believe in encountering Putin on his terms. Putin is intelligent. He is informed. He is a careful strategic thinker. He knows what he's doing, and he's prepared himself to do it. So let's begin at the beginning. Why are we surprised? Putin is a bit like Hitler really. Mein Kampf said exactly what Hitler was going to do and why he was going to do it. In a series of speeches over the last two years Putin has said exactly what he's going to do in the Ukraine, and indeed, rather more eloquently and more forcefully and with, I think, much better historical knowledge, he's explained why he's going to do it. So, let's begin. Let's look at those speeches. They've again been denounced as pseudo-history, you know, czarist fantasies. Well, yes and no, they're actually, I think, really quite good history. So, what is the Ukraine? Where will you find the map, uh, where will you find the Ukraine on the map of Europe in the 16th century? You won't. 17th century, you won't. The 18th century, you won't. The 19th, no, you won't either. You won't find it until 1922. That's the starting point. That's the starting point, at least in the mind of Putin. What is the Ukraine? It's a huge slice of this vast, featureless plain of Northern Europe that stretches really the whole of the way, pretty much, from the Rhine to Eurasia. Um, this, the section uh, that we're dealing with in the Ukraine is between the two seas of the Baltic in the north and the Black Sea in the south, and it's divided into two by the great river of the Dnieper that goes right down the middle of it, and on one side there is the uh, eastern Ukraine, on the other there is the western Ukraine. I refer to the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. What is this? land then. Well, it's essentially a fought over ground. It's fought over between empires. In the north, there's the Empire of Sweden. There are the various expansionary German forces, uh, things like the, uh, the Hanseatic League, uh, who are the traders that go along the Baltic, and there are the, uh, the, the, there are the, 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 the Prussian knights, um, who uh, in the late Middle Ages advanced the cause of Christianity and Prussia along, again, uh, that, that northern section of this plain immediately to the south of the Baltic.
There's a German expansion there. There is uh, to the south, it's the Ottomans. Uh, to, the, uh, to the east, it's the developing power of Russia, Muscovite Russia, and then to the west. And actually holding much, most of this vast sweep of territory is a country that we've really almost forgotten existed. It is the vast, vast territories of the Commonwealth of Poland-Lithuania, which is really a layer of, of noble landowners imposed on a vast semi-nomadic, semi-peasant population below them and controlling this vast area. And it's fought over. It's fought over repeatedly. And the victor is Russia. Russia under Peter the Great. And if you actually look at Putin, Putin is obsessed with the Tsars. He sees himself as a Tsar. Look at how he's presented himself when he gave these speeches. Where is he? He's in these vast hugely rich rooms of the Kremlin. When he presents his case to the Russian Security Council, this isn't an office, it's a vast rotunda with great columns and he is placed in the centre and, and his, the, the various members of the Security Council are at little desks arrayed round. It, looking, for heaven's sake, it looks like a, a, a Tudor Privy Council, the monarch on high, uh, everybody else dotted the ground, all saying yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, in a vast theatrical space, a vast theatrical imperial czarist space. So it is the first of these great czars, Peter the Great, and by the way, Putin, the American president for quite a long time, had a statue of Churchill in the White Office. He has in his office, he has a huge bronze statue of Peter the Great, because it's Peter the Great who at the end of the 17th century conquers the eastern side of this what is what we now call the Ukraine up to the great river the Dnieper and then who is it who takes the rest well under the second of the greatest of the czars actually German by birth Catherine the Great and her general Suvarov and and again uh, in these extraordinary historical disquisitions Catherine the Great and this great general Suvarov come up all the time. So what happens in the in, in the Tsarist epoch of Russian history is that the, the Russian state, the, the Russian imperial state, the Tsarist state, thrusts itself right to the east and it, in the process of course it destroys Poland completely and absorbs it. Poland is split up three ways between the three empires of Prussia, um, German, Germany, Prussia, um, uh, and the uh, and the uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, uh, and 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 Russia is divided uh, between all of those. And Catherine the Great not only uh, seizes this vast section of of what was formerly Poland, Lithuania, she and Suvorov in particular also take cutting down to the very south towards the Black Sea. They take uh, uh, the, 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 the northern littoral of the Black Sea from the Ottomans. So Catherine the Great and Suvorov uh, conquer the whole of the west of the Ukraine right the way down to the Black Sea. So these territories are assembled together for the first time under a single ruler by the Tsars, by Peter the Great and by Catherine the Great. This is what Putin said, and Putin is absolutely right. Point one. Point two, and this has confused a lot of people. He has then said it is the communists, it is Lenin, who actually create the Ukrainian state. Well, actually, I'm afraid he is right. Have any of you, have we all forgotten? I actually got to look it up to make sure I remembered it the right way around. Do you remember born in the, do you remember the old USSR and how it came up in pop songs and whatever? It means the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So what happened was that in theory, with the revolution uh, and the shaping of a new constitution after the revolution of 1917, Russia was divided, the old vast Russian empire was divided into a series of national republics, one of which, and indeed the biggest apart from you know, Russia itself, uh, was the Ukraine. So the communists for the first time put together into a single unit of government, the East and the West Ukraine. That's what Putin says, and Putin is absolutely right. And moreover, 
after the Second World War, uh, when the you know the uneasy standoff develops between Putin, between between Stalin and the West, between uh, it's very easy to confuse the two of them when the uneasy standoff uh, uh, develops between uh, between uh, the USSR and the USA. Russia deliberately has the Ukraine amongst I think one is it two other of the Soviet republics actually given independent theory independent seats um, uh, uh, in the United Nations to so will help balance things out against America and its allies. Now of course this the, the whole structure of the multinational um, as it were quasi autonomous republics of the USSR was a fiction. It was a highly centralized dictatorship uh, but it was held together by the structures of the Communist Party which penetrated all the other formal institutions of government. In the same way, the constitution of the USSR was one of the most admirable in guaranteeing you know, every kind of variety of human and legal right, except it didn't work because it was run from the centre by the Communist Party on the one hand and the horrors of the secret police um, on the other, the KGB, of which, of course, uh, Putin was a, a notable example. He was actually a KGB officer. In other words, we have the Soviet Union in theory disintegrating the empire, recognising rights of national self-determination with it, but in reality keeping its structure, its highly centralised structure. This, of course, fulfils, uh, as always, Starkey's law of revolutions, that what revolutions do is perpetuate the worst features of the Ancien Regime. And of course, the fall of the Soviet Union has revealed this. As the, the structures of communism of the communist state fell away, you're now left and left naked in the case of Putin with the surviving imperial ambition. So Putin's account of uh, the, 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 if you like, the artificiality, indeed, the artificiality of the frontiers of the Ukraine carved out by a former imperial domination, exactly, of course, like the various countries in Africa were carved out by the clash of empires in the 19th century, and the Ukraine is exactly like that. That's where he's right. Where he's wrong is that in the 19th century, there was a very serious and developing movement uh, for um, a separate identity for the Ukraine, which was enormously increased, of course, by the savagery of Stalin in the 1930s, uh, when as part of his programme of forced collectivization, he carries out a holocaust, um, um, actually a holocaust by famine um, uh, in, in, in the Ukraine, which leads to casualties on the same scale as Hitler, as Hitler's Holocaust of the Jews. You're looking at a comparable number, five, six million, dying in the Ukraine of starvation and, of course, producing some of these visceral hatreds uh, that we are seeing now um, uh, um, across the frontier that now intensely disputed fought over frontier between Russia and the Ukraine. So Putin then, in one sense, through his lens of history, has got it right. The Ukraine is assembled by Russia. It is only the force of Russian arms that puts it together under Catherine the Great and Peter the Great, and it is only the force of Russian arms in the Second World War that stops the Nazis from conquering it. This is what all Putin's rather otherwise rather obscure references to. I'm going to make sure they say they claim they want the Ukrainians claim they want the place decommunized. I will show them what decommunization means in his light. Decommunization means, as it's the communists that create the quasi-state of the Ukraine, decommunization means reabsorbing the Ukraine into the Russian Empire. And again, it's really important that we understand this more fully. Putin has consciously revived. I referred to uh, the, 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 the vast rooms in which he always appears, the staggering ornamentation uh, of, of the decorations, the plastering of everything in gold. Um, Putin has consciously revived Tsarism. 
the Russian state now uses effectively the arms of the czars, the eagle, eagles and so on. Um, it uses the, the symbolism. It, it has started to revive the Orthodox Church. There's a sense of, you know, Mother Russia, um, the, the extraordinary turbulent forces that you see in Tolstoy and that you see in the great Russian operas, you know, Mussorgsky and all the rest of it. Putin is playing that and playing it very effectively. We, of course, focus in the opposition in Russia. I'm not sure how much it speaks to the broader mass of the Russian people. Why should they have changed? Now, this again is the problem, of course. To us, the idea that you might take seriously a 19th century empire is laughable. Doesn't Putin know? Everybody's saying, doesn't it know that the world's moved on? You know, in uh, our 16, 16 year old woke schoolgirl, doesn't he know, like, that war is so like, so last century like? Well, no, he doesn't. Because Putin, unlike us, understands power. Power, power, and the role of force. We thought you could dispense with it. He knows you can't. This is the this is this is the the, 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 the fundamental, the, 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 the core of our incomprehension, of our failure to read an opponent and our own folly. We are doing, I'm afraid, what the Bible says, we are reaping what we have sowed, and what we sowed was thistles, thorns, and tares. That's what we're reaping. So, what does Putin think? What's he done? Putin, again, addressed this. He was questioned. He occasionally allows questions. And he's actually better at answering them than either Boris Johnson, very much better than President Biden. Um, he was asked by a journalist when he declared, uh, not actually when he declared war, but when he announced his intention of declaring war, um, how could a good country, good person, actually declare war? And Putin's reply is really very extraordinary. Let me read it to you. Why do you think if you are good, you can't use force? Goodness implies the possibility to defend yourself. Now, that would have been a statement that until the 1980s, everybody in the West would have agreed with. And since then, we've stripped off We've thrown away our arms. We've done what another bit of the Bible says. We've turned our swords into plowshares. And we are naked to our enemies. Because Putin adopts completely the opposite line. Putin sees, as Bismarck did, as Churchill did, as Palmerston did, as Queen Elizabeth I did, as everybody did, force as the ultimate instrument of policy. In the same way that finally force is the centre of all law. Power is the centre of all law. Law is meaningless without the power of the state to enforce it. Let's begin first by looking at what Putin did and then look at what we did. Putin decided that he would prepare for war. He's been preparing under our nose for years. There has been this astonishing reform of the Russian armed services. They had become a joke. Um, they were falling to pieces in, in the latter days of the communist regime. Putin has reformed and has rearmed and re-equipped and redisciplined his army so that it is now easily the fourth best in the world, fourth biggest, fourth strongest in the world after America, China and India. Everybody jokes, don't they? Oh, you know, Russia is just Spain with nuclear weapons or Saudi Arabia with nuclear weapons. No, it isn't. Russia is now a great power again. That was Putin's aim and Putin has achieved it. How's he done it? Apparently, if you actually look at the if you look at the uh, international tables of comparison, Britain and Russia spend roughly the same on an army on 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 sorry on on their defence establishment. 
The problem is that's a wholly misleading comparison. It's done by looking at dollar exchange rates. They tell you nothing about internal purchasing power. If you actually look at the purchasing power parity, you have a totally different picture. Because wage, rate, wage rates are so much lower in Russia, you can get much more bang and far more troops for your buck. And by the way, uh, the Russian army has re-equipped itself in a fashion which shames the Ministry of Defence. It's actually got tanks that work. It's got missiles that reach their target. It hasn't wasted endless sums of money on things that don't work. And moreover, unlike us, who've wrecked our public finances. Putin has built up a staggering reserve of gold and convertible currencies. Do you remember, we used to have those before Gordon Brown threw them all away at the absolute bottom of the gold market. Putin has a war chest of not far short of $500 billion. $500 billion. And we play around with sanctions of a few billion. What do we think of a difference it will make? So Putin then, just like a Bismarck, just like a Hitler, just like a Palmerston, just like a Churchill, understands the use of power. What did we do with power? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we persuaded ourselves you could live without it. We in the West have been living in a fiction. We've been living in a fictional world in which we thought that power was unnecessary. Power was vulgar. Power was nasty. I remember when I appeared uh, with Ian Dale um, uh, and uh, uh, um, there was a, you know, uh, 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 that rather disagreeable lefty, Paul Mason, on the show, I ventured to say that if you look at the classical formulations of legal authority by people like Jeremy Bentham, uh, he emphasises the importance of law resting finally in a monopoly of force or power. I pointed out that Bentham says that international notions of international law and notions of, hu of universal human rights are nonsense on stilts. And for my pain, I was denounced by Mason as a Nazi, effectively, because I talked about power. Sorry, power is the basis of human society. It can't work otherwise. We've thought otherwise. It works internally. We all know, finally. There is a police, the reason you obey the law, finally. Well, if the Met gets around to it and isn't busy pursuing, isn't busy bending the knee or, 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 or arresting somebody for saying a rude word about a transsexual, if you break the law, you will be arrested, you will be taken to court, you will be found guilty and you will be put in jail. That's called force. But we persuaded ourselves that there was this thing called an international world order. There was a thing called international law. That there were things called universal human rights. And we thought they were real things. They're not. They're fictions and they're myths. The only reason that the fictions and myths seem to have a little bit of reality, you know, when we intervened in the Balkans and dragged off uh, the Serbian leader to a, to a trial um, uh, in, in the International Court of The Hague, was that we were able to apply force. Let's just look again at this notion of the world order. It was tried, of course, it's a product of American idealism. It was tried after the First World War with Woodrow Wilson and the creation of the League of Nations, and of course that collapsed because America wasn't involved in it and there wasn't therefore a power of force behind it. It was tried again with very similar intent after the Second World War, with another American pushing it through, not so much Roosevelt as himself, uh, but, but, but Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt's wife, who is the idealist uh, behind the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and all that sort of thing. And it sort of works in the Cold War, because America is a highly aggressive power, 
It has by far the largest and most effective armed forces in the world, and it has a nuclear deterrent, and it's pretty clear, if need be, but certainly use the armed forces, it would actually use the nuclear deterrent. So you can, you can enforce a kind of order. But what we've forgotten is that that order does not depend upon the myth of international law. It doesn't depend upon the myth of the United Nations. It doesn't depend upon the myth of, of, of universal human rights. It depends ultimately on the fact that there is a force, America, NATO, whatever, that is prepared to enforce those values. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union and our deciding we can't be bothered to spend any money on defending ourselves, inevitably that vision of right, which is our vision of right, is collapsing. Because again, our, the problem with this, this notion of universal human rights, international law, the world view of the 16-year-old work schoolgirl, is that we assume it's shared by everybody. Oh no, it's not. It's perfectly clear. I mean, when we've tried to export it, when we tried catastrophically to export it to Libya or to Iraq or to, um, or to even the most catastrophic of all, to, to Afghanistan, we discover people don't actually share these values. And again, look at some of the silly things that have been said about Putin. Oh, Putin is now a pariah. Well, you'll be a pariah amongst the West. But, you know, the democracies, I think, at the last count, are only a fifth, one-fifth of the states in the world. I think Putin will be a hero. I think he'll be a hero in Iran. I think Putin will be a hero in quite large chunks of Latin America because he's given the West a bloody nose. He will be a hero probably in Pakistan. In fact, Imran Khan, would you believe it, is in Russia even as we speak now. He will be a hero in seized China because, of course, what's happening in the Ukraine is opening the door directly to Taiwan. They have different values. Can we not understand that? They are articulated by different values, emotions, desires from us. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us most things. Man shall not live by bread alone. We in the West have assumed that all people want is material satisfaction. Other people think differently. And until we recognise that difference, we are lost. It used, as I said, to be the job of proper history teaching to get people to understand that earlier societies and different societies had operated according to different values. We've thrown that out of the window with the absurdity, again, always Blair, isn't it? Always leading the way and making apologies for the past for things that, of course, in the past were not regarded as wrongs and certainly weren't regarded as wrongs in the way they are now. It is the refusal to recognise human difference. But, of course, we did much more than believe in the myths. We also translated the myths into practice. Putin believed in power, and he translated power into reality by his policies of the reform of the army, of building up reserves. We are afraid expressed our disbelief of power too, uh, we spend, wait for the figures, we spend 80% of our budget on two things, well, three things, on the NHS, on welfare, and on the old age pension. That leaves every other activity of the state with 20% of what you pay in tax. And it leaves defence with Four percent. Four percent. Four percent. Which is why, of course, we are helpless. Russia can do what it wants. That's the plain truth. It was another Roosevelt, Theodore, who had that wonderful phrase saying, speak softly and carry a big stick. We bellow and wave around a straw. It's shameful. And of course, 
We have incapacitated ourselves in every way by a series of absurd priorities in government policy. I've already you know, given the picture of the British state, and this is true of all the Western states. What we are now effectively is a welfare service with a little tiny state attached. And in the case of some states, this isn't even, even that isn't an adequate description. Shall I read what the head of the German army, the Bundeswehr, has said. I never thought I would have to live through another war. Can I repeat that? This is from a professional soldier. I never thought I would have to live through another war. The Bundeswehr, the army that I lead, is more or less dry. It has no military resources. The options we can offer politicians to support the alliance, that's NATO, are extremely limited. If you may remember, they performed drill with sticks and brooms. That is the extreme case, but it's pretty much true throughout the West. We are helpless. Now, this has terrible consequences. It has consequences that I don't think we want to face because we all decided that really, you know, surviving, that uh, the, the notion that the state might have the first duty of protecting the individual citizen and that the first duty of a state is to defend its frontiers. We've thrown all that away, haven't we? We're terribly irresponsible. We can't even keep, you know, a collection of lads with mobile phones in dinghies in the channel off. Um, much less the Russians, because we thought there were other more important things. We thought, you know, the planet was about to burn up and it was our absolute duty to decarbonize. So we've closed our nuclear power stations, we've closed our coal power stations, we're trying to close down our gas-fired uh, power stations, we are refusing to develop our North Sea oil fields, we are refusing to frack. Where does our power come from? Remember, we depend upon power in the same way that ancient Rome depended on the aqueducts that carried water. And what we've done it took, who did it take? It took the barbarians to cut the aqueducts to Rome, and Rome then shrivels from the capital of the world to a village. I'm afraid we've left ourselves in the position that, because of inane environmentalism, don't get me wrong, I think decarbonisation will be a thoroughly sensible idea, providing you can do it with a strategic sense of we need power. We need power. We need gas to be blunt in, at the moment in exactly the same way that ancient Rome needed water. And the prime supply of gas, there are two main sources of gas to Europe. One is from Norway and the other, which is fine, thank heavens, and we get most of ours from it, and the other is from Russia and Germany. This vast powerhouse, or literal powerhouse of industry, depends on Russian gas. It has, it has closed down its nuclear plants. Again, the catastrophic Merkel was responsible for closing down the German, German nuclear power. Um, we are we, In Britain, again, we've refused to develop things like and the, the, the vast power of the tides in the Bristol Channel and, and, and the Thames Estuary because it might interfere with a few seabirds. We've had the policies of inanity, of childish inanity. Again, an environmentalism that says we need to rewild our countryside. It's always possible. To, why bother with British farming? You can always buy food. By the way, the Ukraine and Russia between them produce, is it, 60% of the world's grain, you know, comes from Russia. Russia, in other words, again, is not Spain with nuclear weapons. Russia is a military superpower and it is a natural resources superpower. And we, ladies and gentlemen, are at their mercy. I never thought, I was born in 1945, I didn't think I would live to see what has happened, to feel so ashamed, to feel 
so much like a Cassandra. You know, she told the truth but was fated never to be believed. <sighs> what can one do? So show a bit of courage. Try and see the truth, speak the truth. And to hope somewhere, <laughs> maybe here at any rate, somebody will listen and somebody will do something and that we'll try and recognise reality. Everybody's talking about Putin living with an imperial myth. Well, the problem is he has given muscle to that myth. He has given the muscle of tanks and missiles and hypersonic systems. So it's not a myth anymore. It is an energising principle. It's the tip of a hypersonic missile. We, on the other hand, have lived by another myth. We've lived by the myth that there's a nice, comforting system of international law and human rights which everybody obeys, don't they? And we've thrown away the only means we had at our disposal of making sure they do obey the rules. Sorry. We have been the foolish virgins. If you remember, the foolish of the wise and foolish virgins were the ones who had oil and didn't have oil. We've thrown our oil away. We've lost, literally, power, both in the sense of lights and power in the sense of that unfortunate need to have the strength to defend yourself against somebody who's not mad, but bad, and wants to harm you. Hello, and thank you for watching David Starkey Talks. If, as I very much hope, you're enjoying them, why not become more actively involved and join my Members Club? As a member, you'll be able to take part in the members-only weekly question and answer session, suggest topics for forthcoming videos, and have priority booking for my forthcoming live events. And while you're at it, why not have a look at the store page on my website, davidstarkey.com. There you can purchase t-shirts and other merchandise, buy signed copies of my books, and, if you're feeling brave and a bit flush, even arrange to take me out to lunch. Thank you once again for watching. I look forward to hearing from you and to welcoming you to my Members Club.